So you go to your first Viking reenactment and you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed and you're not really sure what to expect. Pull up a bench. Now, if you're heading to your first Viking reenactment, chances are you've been in contact with people from the group that you're about to join already, and that means that you've actually already done a fair bit of legwork in terms of getting in touch with a local group, figuring out the period and the era that you're interested in. And if it's a Viking era group, there tends to be a sort of global experience of Viking reenactment, which makes it a really interesting hobby to be a part of, because it means wherever you are in the world, you're likely to have experiences that you can share and that you can kind of, uh, well, I'm not sure, what's the positive version of commiserate? And that's great because it means that you can relate to people from all over the world who share in this hobby, and you can share in the experiences and memories that you have. It really is a fantastically uh, diverse yet uh, sort of, I guess, universal experience. And that's not just Viking reenactment, but all reenactment, basically. So what are you going to see at this crazy thing that is a historical reenactment? Well, uh, I'm going to pour myself some tea and I'm going to tell you. If anybody asks, this is a Gong Dao Bay. Nobody ask. Please. Well, depending on where you go, the site itself might be a field. It might be a municipal park, it might be a magnificent country house, or, if you are lucky enough to be uh, a part of the group that I'm in, it may even be a fully recreated Anglo-Saxon town. This is actually in Jarrow, in the northeast of England, and it's a fantastic site, so thank you very much to Marco and the team for letting me film whilst I was there, uh, and thank you to Tony as well uh, for helping organise the event. So the first thing you're going to see is old stuff. My light just went out. Is it making much difference? No. The first thing you're going to see is old stuff, but that's to be expected, right? Well, yes, but the thing you're going to see is old stuff, old clothing, people wearing funny old clothes with modern people around them. And that's jarring and it's fun to see. But that's the first thing that you're going to see. But the first thing that you're going to s properly encounter is a whole bunch of new people that you've never met before. So just be prepared for that experience, and if you are an extroverted weirdo like me, and the idea of meeting 200 new people and then drinking around a campfire with them sounds like heaven, you're going to have a wonderful time. If you're a little more introverted, just remember, you can always just check out for a minute. You can always just check out, and you're going to walk into a field, or you're going to see a row of tents, and you're going to see a battlefield with people fighting, or you're going to hear the noise and sounds of a fun fair or a country fair, and that's overwhelming, especially if you, you find um, sort of big crowds and lots of noise very overwhelming. And a lot of people do, and I respect that and I sympathise. Um, you can always find somewhere to just go and chill out for five minutes, and nobody should mind. And group leaders and membership officers, if you're listening, it's always worth just reminding people of that. It's always worth reminding new members that they don't have to always be present if they need to just chill out. It's perfectly fine. So remember that, guys. So you probably also, as soon as you arrive, these new people are going to see somebody coming over to greet you, whether it's the membership officer you were emailing or the group leader or just a helpful member of the team who's seen a new face and wants to make sure that they're okay. And then, like as not, you will be swept under somebody's arm and taken over to the Living History Display, uh, or the Living History Encampment, or LHE, as it's generally known in British reenactment. The term LHE, um, the, or the letters LHE, stand for Living History Encampment, uh, and that is a, a blanket term for the reenactment bit of any event. In the UK, it's very common to have reenactors as part of a wider event, so. They might be as part of a summer fair at a large country house. They might be part of a fun fair. Uh, they might be there to commemorate a, spe a special event at a town, and there will also be talks and a market and food stalls. Or they might just be there to supplement a visitor attraction that's already there, as is the case with the Jarrow events. That Anglo-Saxon village is always there, but it's not always that it's filled with early medieval types doing stuff. You're probably going to see people practicing crafts, and 
especially in early medieval uh, LHEs, you will see a whole host of people doing crafts. At some Viking Age events you will have tile makers, and you will have illuminators, and you will have butchers, and you will have brewers, and you will have bakers, and you will have tablet weavers, and you will have flower grinders, millers, armourers, blacksmiths, you get where I'm going with this. Some of the more common ones are things that you can easily cart around to different events, so people will sometimes take uh, some of their mail setting tools to make mail, they'll take a coin stamp and die set so that they can hammer coins, and sometimes the kids will get a coin if they go up to the, the, the coin, coin, coin maker, um, or they can hammer their own slightly bad coin off centre and be like, look I made a penny! It's great fun. Um, but generally the more common ones you'll see are things like tablet weaving and spinning on a drop spindle, and you will see people embroidering and doing various crafts, and often they're doing those crafts to um, to improve on and to decorate their actual kit. So the things that they're making or dyeing will then go into their kit. Uh, and that's a great part of reenactment events, is if you've got stuff that you need to work on, take it along and just sew it. And if you're not sewing with a boar bristle sewing needle and completely authentic waxed wool thread, no one's gonna mind. People are just gonna see a Viking sewing his own pants and they love that. So take some crafts along if you want to take a historical craft, take that along, and this is how you learn historical crafts. My friend Carrie here is an expert dyer and a fantastic drop spindle spinner, uh, and she basically taught me how to dye and how to use a drop spindle, because I went up to her many years ago and said, how does that work then? Uh, and when she was dying I said, hmm, that looks like fun, how does it work? Can I have a go? And generally, if you go up to somebody and say, hello, that looks really cool, how does that work? They're more than happy to engage you, because people like it when you enjoy what they're doing. People love it when new people find their craft interesting. I've learnt basket weaving and pottery and bone working just by going up to people and going, have you got a spare bit and can I play? And they'll be like, yes sir! It's great fun, so expect to see lots of crafts that you can ask about, uh, you can learn about, you can learn, you can have a go, and sometimes you can just chill out and just watch a craftsperson at work. There's something so soothing and mesmerising about watching somebody just practice a craft, practice the gong fu of something, and just make things. It's possible that like at this event we're seeing here, you'll see people wearing face masks, and it's very important in these times to make sure that people are following the rules. So members of the public have a wonderful habit uh, of trying to get through the rope barriers, over and under the rope barriers, around the rope barriers, and digging tunnels beneath the rope barriers so that they can get a closer look at what you're doing. If you're at a COVID critical site, or you're a site where there are rules in place, because of COVID-19, make sure that you're safe and they're safe, because otherwise the client and the people running the site will get cross with you and might not invite you back. Just be aware that most reenactment events are taking place on someone else's property, and because of that you A, have to respect their property, B, follow their rules, and C, that's three, you know what I mean, uh, you have to understand that there are literally millions of dollars of insurance money at play if something goes wrong. If a child accidentally walks into the campfire, or God forbid the blacksmithing forge, and hurts themselves, that could be seriously bad for a lot of people, including the person who gets hurt. So just be aware that there may be some people around who are enforcing the rules. You will get people who will ask you, have you, have you got your authentic face mask? Have you done such and such a form? Have you been given your membership card? Because your membership card shows that you are covered by the, co the group's insurance. There will possibly be people enforcing the rules. And they're doing that to make sure that everyone's safe and everyone can have fun and do this hobby. Just bear with them because they are, I promise you, under a huge amount of stress and pressure. It takes a lot to organise these events and I've organised a couple and it's maddening at times. Expect to see food. Again. Normal circumstances, many reenactment events are fully catered, which is wonderful. Some expect you to bring all your own food, some will provide you just with lunch whilst you're on the LHE, and they'll expect you to make your breakfast while you're camping and your dinner while you're camping. 
Societies like the Sealed Knot have a slightly different way of working to some early medieval societies, and that's usually because their events can have hundreds or even thousands of people involved. A literal army is a difficult thing for a government to feed, let alone a team of a dozen volunteer hobbyists. So usually, at massive events, you will sort of be with your little local group or regiment or however your society uh, labels individual groups within the umbrella corporation. Yeah. Uh, and they may prepare the food for you, you may pay five or ten pounds for the weekend so that they can buy all the food in, or they might expect you to just make your own food, bring stuff for a barbecue, that kind of thing. But expect there to be food. There will be food. Reenactors love f eating, drinking, and feeding and watering their friends and family. And if you are a noob, somebody will give you food and drink. If you don't drink, make that abundantly clear. Uh, and that sort of leads into my next little bit, which is never feel pressured. If somebody is pressuring you to drink, run away and tell somebody. That is always inappropriate behaviour. If somebody is pressuring you to do an activity that you're not comfortable with, tell them and then make sure your group leader is aware that you've been made to feel uncomfortable. Veteran reenactors, this is for you. Do not pressure people into doing stuff. Right? You can you can encourage people, you can be like, this is great fun, have a go at it. No, I'm okay. You sure? Yeah. Well, if you change your mind, that is the approach. Not, come on, don't be a wimp. That's not cool. Nobody likes that. When I was 18, 19, 20, people would come at me with that attitude and be like, come on, do it. No. No, I'm not. Now I'm not gonna. I might have done until you decided to try and force me, but now, no. My back's up. Not doing it. So, never feel pressured, whatever it may be, a uh, craft, a hobby, or drinking, smoking, something, never take drugs, just say no. Combat. Combat is the big one. In reenactment, a lot of people are there just for the fighting, and they encourage you to be there for the fighting as well. And if you are joining a group and you go to your first event and there's only fighting, there are no crafts, there are only men, uh, and they are all talking about how they're part of the same folk, Run away, because they're probably racists. Um, but a good reenactment group will always respect you, and always respect what you do and don't want to do at their events. And if all you want to do is get dressed in the clothes, sit down in the sun, and relax at the weekend with some new friends, what a wonderful reason to join a reenactment society. What a fantastic reason to do that. Do that. I've had the most wonderful weekends away where I have packed my car full of my spears, shield, mail shirt, helmet, sword. I've taken three different changes of clothes. I've taken fancy clothes and common clothes and warrior kit. And I have spent the day just in my linens with a nice horn full of cider watching the world go by. And it's just been fantastic. Fantastic, and I didn't pick up a weapon the entire weekend, and I just had a wonderful relaxing time. Reenactment is what you want it to be. It's a, it's, it's a very versatile hobby. So you might find all of these crafts and all of these things going on at the same time really daunting. And bear in mind, you don't have to try all of them. You don't have to try any of them. Your first event is a taster. And sure, you may have paid a subscription fee to the society, that's normally not too expensive. You may have paid a temp fee. Uh, and I know that the uh, Sealed Knot and Regia do temp fees, I think the SCA does ev per event fees and that kind of pay-to-play fees, and it's your chance to go to this thing and go, right, they've given me a loan of some clothes for the weekend, or I've just made my first set of clothes, and I'm going to see what it feels like. And if you get there and you think, oh, you know what, not really sure, don't really like that the public are around, I don't I don't know, I'm not, not big on the whole campfire scene, I'm not sure. That's absolutely fine, you're under no obligation to go to another event. If you go to an event for the first time and you think, oh wow, oh, I, I loved taking part in that training session this afternoon, I'd love to get further into the combat, but because I'm, I'm not trained up yet, I can't take part in the afternoon battles, maybe next time I'll do that. That's a great attitude. Take your time. I've been reenacting for well over a decade now. I've done about a quarter of the activities that I could have done. I think it was last... I don't know, it can't be last year now. That was a gas leak year. 
I think it was 2019 when I first set foot on a Viking boat on the water. After what? Nine, ten years of being a reenactor? Eight years of doing Viking reenactment? First time on a boat on the water. It took me eight years. It happens. It took me a good two or three years before I started thinking about trying my hand at some crafts. It took me about a week before I started tablet weaving, but tablet weaving rocks. Uh, you, you may decide that you want to try all of the craft activities, and you can take your time over that. You are under no obligation to be perfect at anything by the end of your weekend. You don't have to talk to the public about anything. Which brings me on to my next part. People have been saying that some of my videos are too chaotic, so I really hope that you're enjoying these little flowy bits. You will encounter members of the public if your first event as a reenactor is a public one. Now, you may be taking part in a 30 years war battle and the public are 200 meters over that way behind the crown line and you are moving around in your regiment around here. You may be at a small local country fair and the public are a safe two meters away from you it may no longer be COVID times when you watch this video, and people may be wandering right up to your face to ask what you're doing. So, be prepared for the public to be there, for them to be involved in what you're doing, for them to be asking you stuff, and for them to take photos of you. You are going to get your photo taken. Um, it's just it's just a fact of life when you're a public-facing reenactor. You're facing the public, and the public carry cameras. There is usually somewhere you can stash yourself in a corner where you're less exposed to that side of things, be it inside a shelter or a tent. If you're at somewhere like Jarrow, you might be inside a house. Unfortunately, the public are also allowed inside the houses, so it may not be quite as safe, uh, but at least you'll be out of the sun and you'll have a little bit more peace and quiet. So be prepared for the public and be prepared for the public to misbehave. Uh, Chris the Redcoat does some great videos on silly questions that he's asked as a reenactor by the public. Um, but you do get people who misbehave, and the big culprits for that, obviously, are little kiddies who don't know any better and run underneath the rope barriers, straight towards you, straight towards the fire pit. <coughs> uh, and that will happen. So, just be aware, you may have rugrats to deal with that are not your own. So, <laughs> you've been warned. If your first event is a training session, the public's less of an issue but you will still have lots of people. Training events are crucial to reenactors because it's where we keep our skills fresh, train each other and new members up, and make sure that we play safely. And they're usually combat oriented. There's usually lots of crafting going on as well because again, it's an excuse to take your crafting along, repair your stuff, make some new stuff. Sometimes there'll be talks or lectures. The SCA is really big on things like what they call kingdom universities which is where loads of experts in their fields and crafts will lecture members on new skills, on aspects of history. I did a lecture on Welsh language in the medieval period, and it's a great way of learning new techniques and new crafts. Most societies have some form of repair day, craft day, stitch and bitch, whatever you want to call it. Combat training sessions are something you should think about attending if you want to be a combat reenactor. It's all very well turning up to your first couple of events, getting safe and getting um, passed in a weapon and being told you're safe on the battlefield. But if you then don't pick that weapon up for another six months, you might well have completely forgotten everything that you learned. So it's worth seeking out your local group and seeing if they do training at the weekend. And if they don't, you can always suggest it on the Facebook group. But let's imagine that your first event is a real event and you've got, say, 60 people all coming together, they're putting up tents, they're putting up work shelters, they're putting on displays for the public. You'll arrive and you'll be told where plastic camping is and where authentic camping is. And many societies don't have authentic camping as a big aspect. Um, people like the Sealed Knot, it's generally a very small proportion of the group attending who will camp in authentic tents on a living history encampment. Again, if you've got 2,000 people, it's difficult to actually fit them all into the little area. So a lot of the time, when you're at a big event like that, you will camp somewhere and then march or walk up to your living history area, which is often 
fairly removed from the actual campsite. Uh, and big civil war events and, and big events like that can really be quite a spectacle for a local area because not only do they have the living history encampment and the battlefield, they've also got this effective town of tents and caravans and campervans. So it's a massive spectacle. Uh, and if your first event is, for example, an English Civil War Society national large major event, you're going to see thousands of people and it's going to get mad quick. But let's say that you've just got 50 or 60 people. You'll arrive, you'll be told this is where you can camp if you've got a plastic tent, a modern tent. This is where you can camp if you've got an authentic tent. You'll pitch your tent, you'll meet a couple of people, hopefully they'll help you put your tent up, which is always a good move for new people. Uh, help them put their tent up if you can. And then hopefully you'll get changed into your kit, or you'll have arrived in kit like I always do, and you can start enjoying yourself. If it's the evening before the main event, you'll probably sit around a campfire, have a couple of drinks, have some dinner, maybe someone will go on a pizza run to the local village or something, and you'll hear people swapping stories, hopefully people will ask you about yourself, ask you who you are, where you're from, what you're interested in, that kind of thing. There might be music, there might be crafting, depending on how much light there is, and eventually everybody will drift off to bed. In the morning, mornings tend to be early at reenactments, especially if they're at country houses or other big events, because events have an opening time at the closing time. And if the opening time for the country house is 9am, you better believe that they want your living history encampment there, open and ready to face the public at 9am, 9.30 at the latest. Because they do not want you to be wandering around with your toothbrush and your PJs on, with members of the public taking pictures of the living history camp. That looks bad. So, you're likely to get woken up fairly early. I tend to wake up at around 7am, uh, sometimes 6.30, depending on when the, the sun comes up at a reenactment. You wake up at the dawn. I love camping because I, I find my body clock adjusts in that way and I sort of go to, go to sleep and then wake up with the dawn and feel refreshed. Again, some groups may make you your breakfast, some groups may expect you to make your breakfast yourself. If you're with a, a smaller group, often what will happen is you'll chip in a fiver or something or a tenner for the group food for the weekend and they will then prepare every meal for you, which is wonderful. And at the moment with COVID, uh, a lot of groups are saying if you stay overnight, we can sort you out brekkie on the campfire because we've got a campfire so we can make you egg sandwiches or bacon sandwiches or, you know, vegan options, whatever they may be. Uh, bacon butty in the morning with a cup of tea. In, in a, oh, 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 God, I, oh God, I miss it. And because of that, you may now, but you may also now be asked to bring your midday meal with you, bring your lunch with you, just because it's difficult to coordinate it safely to have everybody sort of queue up to the table, get their food and then leave without breathing on something or touching something or COVIDing something up to the eyeballs. So you may be a forgetful chump like me and have to drive to the local supermarket halfway through the day and get yourself a very authentic Morrison's bag full of very authentic pop and olives. And bear in mind that you may have to bring food. So ask in advance or find out and group leaders Tell your people if they need to cater. And this was on me. This was nothing to do with Tony who organised the Jaro event. I just completely ballsed up. Just to reiterate, if at food times you don't want to sit next to everybody else, you don't want to sit by the public, you even want to go back to your tent and just chill out for an hour, go do that. It's a hobby. This is meant to be fun for you. If fun for you is sitting constantly around people, chatting away and eating and drinking and having a wonderful time, brilliant. If fun and enjoyment for you is little bit of socialising, pop back to the tent. Little bit of socialising, go for a little walk. Little bit of socialising, go for a schnooze. That's fine. I've had a couple of events where I've been peopled out by lunchtime, talking to the public. I've had a heavy week full of school workshops, talking to kids. I just want to have a little nap in the sun. So, I'm just gone, slightly behind the rope barrier, taking a lie down, and just had a little snooze for an hour. And then I'm usually rudely awakened by a kick. Uh, and somebody asked me to go and get my chainmail on. So, let's talk about fighting again. We discussed the training aspect of fighting, and at your first event, you're probably going to see some people dressed in weird clothing, battering the crap out of each other in a battlefield. This is a pretty small battlefield, as battlefields go. Sometimes they're huge, sometimes they can only fit seven or eight people safely. The key thing to remember is, 
you do not have to take part. And at your first ever event, unless you've been made safe with a weapon, you shouldn't take part. So again, don't feel pressured. If you don't feel safe, if you're not safe, objectively, steer clear. Yeah, I know it's great fun and it looks amazing. This is a safety critical part of the hobby. You gotta be careful here. Especially if it's a later period event and it involves guns. So, the battlefield is generally where you will see training, and if it's not a public display of combat, the training is something that you might be able to take part in, and is always good fun. And it's a great way of getting to know some of the other members of the group, it's a great way of getting to know the fighting side of things, the rules, and just chatting with people, and again, learning new skills. It's always good fun. So you're going to see fighting, like as not, at your first event. If it's a craft-only event, or you are in a property or in an old building doing a display, you may not see fighting. I have, however, done a combat display, full combat combat display, full combat, full contact combat display with swords in the Liverpool World Museum in front of the giant skeletons and stuff. It's awesome. So be prepared to see that. And that is, quite frankly, what the majority of people go to historical reenactments for. Some people find that a sad fact, but as somebody once said to me, you will get people who are interested in the crafting, you'll get people who are interested in the trade, you'll get people who are interested in the language, but the kids go there to see a f***ing good fight. And that's absolutely true. <laughs> that's absolutely the case. There's a reason it's called the English Civil War Society, not the 1640s and 50s society. You know? <laughs> There's a reason for that. Lots of people go to reenactments to see the fighting, so you will be asked, when is the battle? Even if you've got five people who are just going to do a basic drill display and getting somebody dressed in their armor, arming the knight is always a fun one for people. You will be asked, when's the battle? <laughs> and you will have to say, well, we've got a bit of a combat display at two o'clock, but I don't think you could call it a battle. Be prepared to be asked questions by the public. And again, if you're not comfortable with that, you can always find somewhere to just shelter yourself away. And be honest as well. If somebody says, excuse me, what's happening here? You can say, to be honest with you, this is my first time, so uh, I'd like to know as much as you. Catherine, what are you doing there? And Catherine will tell you that she is embroidering, and then Mike will tell you what he is representing and why he is dressed like that and not wearing shoes. And the learning experience and the friendships begin, and that's part of it. If it's your first event, you're kind of one step up from being a member of the public, you know? You're not a veteran reenactor and living historian who's had a bad back for 30 years because he's slept only on a field, and you're not a member of the public who has no idea what's going on. You're somewhere in between, and it's an exciting place to be. So, your first event is going to be soaking wet, bone dry, freezing cold, and boiling hot. So remember, Take warm clothes, take a change of clothes in case you sweat through, take sun cream and apply it regularly. Yes, Carrie, I know. I know I never do it. No editing, Jimmy. Don't show the picture. Don't show the... Oh, yeah, I didn't reapply sun cream and I was wearing Celtic war paint. Moving on. And always hydrate. Always hydrate. Ow. Ow! Why did that crack? Oh God, I'm falling apart. I need more tea. Hydration is so important at reenactments, and you will forget it in the excitement of fighting or because you're chilling out in the sun. And the last thing you want to do is do a jimmy and end up with heat exhaustion and really bad sunburn. So bad that you have to get a special cream to put on afterwards for the next few days. So do not do that. Stay hydrated. Very often, <laughs> you will get people, when you're new or daft, like me, who will come up to you and say, have you put your sun cream on? Have you drunk enough water today? Have you eaten your lunch? Have you brought food with you? Have you remembered your bowl? Have you remembered your spoon? Have you remembered your knife? I am the guy who always remembers to forget. I always forget something, every single event. I always, always forget something. Uh, and it is usually sun cream and a bowl to eat from. So, yeah, bear that in mind if you ever see me at an event, just kind of holding soup in my outstretched hand situation normal. That's all stuff to think about and above all the thing you're gonna see at your first reenactment event is a colourful and explosive demonstration of people's passion for history. 
you're going to see people who love the past, who love researching the past, who love recreating the past so that they can teach people about it and so that they can share it with their friends. And that's what you're going to see most of all is people like me who want you to learn about the past in a way that's fun and in a way that you can enjoy at the weekend and that you can really immerse yourself in. There's nothing better than sitting around a campfire in a forest with the sparks going up into the air, with people drinking mead and authentic foods being eaten and the sun setting and everybody's wearing medieval clothes and it's just a fantastic experience to share with people. So I really, really do hope that if you're thinking of joining a reenactment society or you are just in the first steps of contacting one, be it through Facebook or emails, or just searching your local area for medieval reenactment Saskatchewan, whatever it may be. I really hope that this video gives you a little nudge and gets you a little bit more excited for it because the season is upon us and hopefully we're going to have a few more events this year. So, thank you so much once again for joining me. If you are enjoying these videos, please do consider joining the Patreon or slipping me a couple of quid on the coffee fund. It all goes into fabric and uh, equipment and hardware to make these videos more exciting, more interesting for you guys. So, until the next time, who will I'm a draw? Oh, oh my god. You're nice as well. But yeah. Here you go, yours. Whoa.